So my topic is a bit specific. It's about the use of focused ion beams and focused electrons in order to pattern materials and to create functional materials devices. So I will try in the first uh, part to give some general perspective of the use of these techniques. And then I will show three examples of uh, these applications that we are developing in our lab. So the first of these applications will be the growth of metallic deposits by cryogenic focused ion beam induced deposition is a direct way and a fast way to create, create electrical contacts onto nanostructures such as this nanowire. In the second case, I will show how we can create ferromagnetic deposits by focused electron beam induced deposition on the tip of atomic force microscopes in order to create magnetic force microscopy tips that we can use to image materials with a soft magnetic behavior. And in the third part, I will show how by using focused ion beam induced deposition using the tungsten hexacarbonyl precursor, we can create very nice uh, structures, three-dimensional structures and in-plane structures that are superconducting and can be used for superconducting devices. But first, let me introduce our lab. We are in Zaragoza, in the north of Spain. Our facility is national facility in Spain for electron and ion microscopies. We have nine electron and ion microscopes for advanced characterization and nanofabrication. We have a clean room with 200 square meters and 12 uh, dedicated uh, technicians for, for this stack in combination with a few scientists. My group is called Nanomidas Group, Nanofabrication and Advanced Microscopies. And my expertise is in nanofabrication. We are in the our group is in the Instituto de Nanociencia y Materiales de Aragón, which is a mixed institute of CESIC and Universidad de Zaragoza. Here is my research group, which is composed of permanent uh, researchers by uh, Turner Track researchers, by postdocs, by uh, PhD students, and by technicians. Here you can see uh, our web page, and you can have a look if you want to have more details on the research I will show today. So my driving force is uh, new developments in nanolithography techniques and their application to functional materials and devices. Very recently, at the end of last year, I have edited a book on these topics. The name of the book is Nanofabrication, Nanolithography Techniques and Their Applications, published by uh, uh, Institute of Physics in UK. So related to this book, we created this animation that I hope you are going to enjoy is about uh, today's technology in order to create uh, functional devices based on lithography. So in this uh, three minute uh, video, you can see how today in technology, we have many electronic devices that have completely changed our life. Our life. How do we build these devices, these electronic devices? So we need to use uh, lithography techniques in combination with thin thin deposition techniques. From a wafer, we can create millions of uh, these small devices, and we have appropriate techniques to create electrical contacts and to create the complex systems we need. We use for that three main lithography techniques, and here you have the, the schemes, the sketches of these three, three techniques. The first is optical lithography, so for that you need to spin coat your sample with a photo resist. And then you have a lens system and a photo mask and there is some pattern drawn on the photo, photo mask that you are going to transfer to your resist. And later you have to develop your resist. And the resist will take the same shape of the patterns that are in the mask. And with an etching process you can transfer these patterns into your sample of interest, which is here in red color. So by removing the resist, you will have your pattern material. In the case of electron beam lithography, we don't use photons in order to change the sensitivity of the resist. In this case, we use a scanning electron microscope, which has an electron source, which has lenses, and in this case, you don't pattern your material at the same time. You have to go little by little scanning the electron beam on the resist. And later you have the same steps. You have to develop the resist, 
but you have to do an etching process in order to transfer the pattern from the resin to the resin. With that, you can get very high resolution in the pattern. And then, the third example I wanted to show is nanoimprint lithography, which is very useful because you can work in parallel by using stamps in which you have some patterns that you are going to transfer first to a resist and from a resist you can transfer to your side. For that you need mount. This mount is put in contact, typically using high pressure and high temperature to modify the shape of the resist. And then you use an etching process to transfer the pattern from the resist to your sample. So this is a very nice way to get cheap uh, nano patterning with a stamp. So which are the future applications of nanolithography? Here I show a few examples that I think will raise your interest. First is the electronic nose based on sensors, then the autonomous car. Third one is robotic processes, which needs a lot of advanced sensors and actuators, quantum computers that you need to manufacture very small quantum bits, or even hybrid machine human, the so-called cyborgs, or autonomous robots that need very advanced uh, electronic control. Good. So now I'm going to go deeper in my research topic. So I used a dual beam system composed of a scanning electron microscope and a focused ion beam. In the case of the focused ion beam, I can do a few processes. For example, I can do milling. So by scanning the focused ion beam, I remove material locally. But I can use also an ion sensitive resist. In that case, I use the focus ion beam in order uh, to uh, irradiate this resist and change the sensi sensi sensitivity of the resist, as I do in electron beam lithography. Sorry. Then, another example I can irradiate areas of a material and I can change the physical properties of these materials. I can change, for example, the crystallographic phase or I can change the magnetic properties, etc. And then the last application is for the growth of nanodeposits, of nanopattern materials. For that, I need a gas injection system. I insert a precursor gas, which is decomposed by the focus ion beam, and I can grow in plane structures, but also out of plane structures. This is called focused ion beam induced deposition. The scanning electron microscope can be used not only for imaging, but also for patterning. When I use it with an etching precursor gas, I can use the electron beam in order to pattern materials directly by removing materials. This is called focused electron beam induced etching. But if the precursor material is of another type, I can grow materials. This is called focused electron being induced deposition material. I can grow two-dimensional materials, but also three-dimensional materials. And of course, I can use it for electron beam lithography as we have seen in the previous animation. So which are the standard applications of focus ion beam SEM processing? The most popular ones are the following. Lamella preparation that you need in order to do transmission electron microscopy imaging, in that case, you create a 50 nanometer thin lamella, which is transparent to electrons in transmission electron microscope. But you can use it for circuit editing. In circuit editing, when you are developing integrated circuits, you have to reconfigure these uh, circuits in the prototyping phase. For that, you need to make holes in your circuit and to reconnect the different parts of the circuit. And for that, you need to grow metallic material, such as these tungsten connections. Another application is in mask repair. In optical lithography, you need to use photomasks. These photomasks photo mask are very expensive and sometimes they have a small defects. So you can use focus ion beam SEM in order to repair these defects. Here you can see a defect. Then you have to remove this defective part and to rebuild, to grow again, material that reconnects and repairs the defect. Also, you can do a slice and view. So with the focus ion beam, you make holes and you take images with the scanning electron microscope. And once you have 100 or 200 images, you reconstruct the three-dimensional shape of these structures. This is a cancer cell 
with some magnetic nanoparticles. My challenge is to find new applications for FIB SEM. The first application is the growth of metallic deposits. And for that, I use focused ion beam induced deposition in cryogenic conditions. You can see this animation in which I have a substrate, I have my focused ion beam, and then I have to cool down the substrate. So I have a, a nitrogen gas, which is cold, and is able to cool down the substrate to minus 100 degrees centigrade. I insert my gas injection system. I condense a precursor layer. And then with the focused ion beam, I irradiate this condensed layer with the wished shape. Later, I heat up again to room temperature. And then I have a deposit with the same, the same shape of the irradiation. So I can use this process, which is very fast. I need very low irradiation. And so I create very low ion damage to create these deposits. I can use it to create electrical contacts to nanostructures. For example, if I want to grow contacts to this nanowire, first I condense the precursor layer, then I irradiate with the focused ion beam. And later I will have again to heat up the substrate to room temperature and the non-irradiated part will evaporate and only the contacts will remain and I can study the electrical properties of these structures. So this is our equipment. This is a, a, a gallium focus ion beam um, from, uh, from Thermo Fisher. And okay, this is the standard uh, equipment with the scanning electron microscope and the focus ion beam. But here we have this cryo module with a liquid nitrogen here that allows uh, cold nitrogen gas to flow inside the chamber and to cool down my substrate. Thanks to that, I can do cryofibid. So why is cryofibid more efficient than a standard fibid? In a standard focused ion beam induced deposition, my precursor layer forms just a monolayer of precursor material on the substrate surface. So when I impinge with my, my focus ion beam, most of the energy of the focus ion beam is delivered in the substrate. It's not used to decompose the precursor molecules. But in cryofibid, as I have a condensed precursor layer, all the energy of the focus ion beam is used to decompose the precursor material. So I can get um, um, an efficiency which is several hundred times faster or bigger than the efficiency using a standard focused ion beam induced deposition. Here we have some Monte Carlo simulation of an impacting 30 kilo electron volt electron volt gallium ion on a platinum precursor layer, as you see that there are many scattering processes that take place only in this condensed layer. And the energy is used to dissociate this precursor. So a couple of examples, using the tungsten as a carbonyl precursor, we are able to create arrays of 100 squares of tungsten cryo deposits with total area 100 times 25 square meters with total ion irradiation time of only 85 seconds compared to 14 hours if I do the process at room temperature using the standard process. So the process is 600 times faster. So I can create the process faster and with minimized ion induced damage because I'm using much lower ion dose. Here's another example using a platinum precursor and I'm uh, patterning this uh, precursor creating a reference grid in only 41 seconds compared to 2.5 hours if I do the process at room temperature. So in this case, the process is 220 times faster. As I mentioned before, you can even create metallic deposits. If you create tungsten cryo deposits, the electrical resistivity is only 800 micron centimeters. So it can be used to create electrical contacts and to measure the electrical properties of this nanowire. And more recently, we have created electrical contacts to uh, two-dimensional uh, materials. So you are able to create these contacts with the shape you want directly with, without uh, uh, the use of any resist. So we are going to explore in future the capability for fast direct uh, growth of contacts of, uh, on these two-dimensional materials. So the second application I want to discuss today is the growth of ferromagnetic deposits by focused electron beam induced deposition. So this process is complex because you have to insert a, a gas precursor that becomes absorbed 
And then there are many interactions of the electron beam taking place with this precursor and with the underlying substrate. So you have many parameters to control, the electron beam acceleration voltage, the electron beam current, the precursor gas type, precursor gas flux, and many other parameters. And there are many scattering processes uh, produced by the primary electron beam, creating secondary electron beams or backscatter electron beams, etc. But for the application I'm going to, to show, uh, I will show that by controlling uh, acceleration voltage, electron beam current, and uh, the appropriate gas precursor uh, type and flux, you can create very nice ferromagnetic nanostructures. You can create two-dimensional structures, you can create three-dimensional structures, out-of-plane wires, but also nanohelices. And which is also very important, you can do this process on any substrate. For example, on the very end of the tip of, of a cantilever. So this is a standard cantilever uh, for an atomic force microscope. You can create a nanowire just at the tip. The motivation of these ferromagnetic nanostructures is their applications in magnetic sensing, magnetic storage, magnetic logic. And the good point is that FEBIT allows high resolution, three-dimensional patterning, and its growth on cantilevers. So this is one of the examples uh, of the sample using the iron nanocarbonyl precursor. Then we are able to create a very narrow uh, iron nanowire, only 34 nanometer in diameter, with a very sharp tip, seven nanometers. So with that, we can do magnetic force microscopy experiments that we do with, uh, in collaboration with the group of Agustina Asenjo in Madrid and Etienne Snake in Toulouse. And the idea is that with very narrow and sharp magnetic tips, we are going to be able to get rid of non-magnetic interactions. We are going to have high lateral resolution. We are going to get low invasiveness. Invasiveness, So it means we are going to control the magnetic interaction between tip and sample. We are able to be to extract the quantitative, quantitative information by doing quantitative uh, magnetic force microscopy. And uh, the magnetic tip has a very high coercive field. So the magnetization remains always in the same direction. It can uh, be also grown on cantilevers that are used for liquid environment. So all these are a lot of advantages of using FIBIT to grow these magnetic tips. In, in order to approach quantitative MFM, you can measure the st magnetic stray fields from these wires. This is done by electronography, and you can quantify the stray fields as a function of the distance between the tip and the sample. Also, very interestingly, you can compare for the same uh, calibration sample, magnetic sample, what is the behavior of different cantilevers. This is a standard cantilever, bought commercially, but here are our cantilevers. This is a, a nanowire, which is not very sharp, and this one is a very sharp nanowire. So the magnetic force microscopy contrast depends on uh, the shape of these uh, nanowires. So you can see that with the standard samples, you create a higher magnetic force microscopy contrast, but this can be advantageous for certain applications, but for other applications, it can be a problem because you are going to affect with the magnetic straight field of your tip, the magnetization state of the magnetic sample you want to achieve. One of the examples is skirmions. In skirmions, these are very soft magnetic materials. So it's observed that uh, you are affecting in a, in, um, in a spurious way the stability of these skirmions by using the standard commercial magnetic tips because you are creating an in-plane magnetic field that is uh, spuriously affect, affecting to the magnetic structure of the skirmion. However, if you use one of these very narrow nanowires with very sharp tips, you are not going to affect the real magnetic structure of these skirmions. Another advantage is the use of these tips for liquid environment. For that, uh, we use uh, biolevers, which are cantilevers typically used in liquid environment. And by growing our iron nanowires, we are able to measure a magnetic hard disk in air conditions or in liquid conditions. And you can observe here that we, observe, uh, we obtain similar uh, MFN contrast and the noise uh, is not affected by using this in liquid environment. So we propose that there can be many applications such as uh, the presence of non-magnetic nanoparticles in solutions 
or some uh, bi um, biological tissue with magnetic deposit that can be studied with this uh, MFM in liquid environment. Also, there is, a high, uh, there is a high lateral resolution of our tips. On the same sample, we compare a commercial tip and one of our tips. In a commercial tip, there is a spurious width, which is caused by the shape of this tip. But for the FIBIT tip, we see that the shape is much closer to the real uh, dimension of this dot. The third topic I want to discuss today is the growth of superconducting deposits but by focused ion beam induced deposition. So by using tungsten hexacarbonyl precursor, it was discovered in 2004 that you can grow a deposit that is superconducting. This deposit has 40% tungsten, 40% carbon, 10% gallium, and 10% oxygen. But the material becomes superconducting this piece electrical resistance equal to zero at around 5 Kelvin. This material is a type 2 superconductor. In type 2 superconductor, superconductor there is a certain region in uh, external magnetic field and temperature in which you obtain a mixed state. Mixed state, it means that if you apply a magnetic field, there is uh, this magnetic field enters the sample in the form of flux quanta. And the distance between this flux quanta is only determined by the amplitude of this external magnetic field. This quanta can be imaged with scanning tunneling microscopy. This was done in collaboration with the group of uh, Hermann Suderov in Madrid. You can observe the nice abricots of uh, um, vortex lattice that is produced when you apply a magnetic field and the magnetic field enters in the form of this flux quanta. As our nanopatterning technique is of high resolution, one can create wires which are very narrow. In this case, 50 nanometer superconducting nanowire. Which is interesting is that if you apply a one Tesla magnetic field, the distance between two vortices is 50 nanometers. So there is no space here to have two rows of vortices. So you only have one row of vortices in the center of this wire. And this is interesting because it gives rise to reentrant superconductivity effects. What does it mean? If you measure the resistance as a function of magnetic field in a standard materials, superconducting materials, you would observe like this. The resistance is zero up to a certain field in which it goes to the normal state and the resistance is fine. But here we have a certain temperature magnetic field range in which the electrical resistance goes up and then decreases again. And the reason for that is that you create at the edges of this nanowire some uh, landscape, uh, which is uh, a, a potential uh, landscape that uh, avoids the vortices to go out of the structure. So the vortices tend to be uh, con condensed in the center of the wire. So they, be, they have less movement, and then they have less dissipation. And this, that is the reason why the resistance decreases again. again. Two years after our discovery, there was another group in the United States that observed the same effect using aluminum uh, nanowires and uh, standard uh, nanopatterning techniques. Another experiment we have recently done is the propagation of uh, vortices in a non-local way to uh, long distances of the order of 10 microns. So our uh, growth technique allows to grow these very long wires with uh, width of 50 nanometer. And then you can do a standard local resistance measurements, such as the one I just presented, in which you apply a voltage, uh, you apply a current between these uh, two uh, arms, and then you measure the voltage between these two arms. But you can do non-local experiments. In non-local experiment, you apply current only through this arm, and you measure voltage through the second arm. But when you apply a magnetic um, and when you apply an electrical current and a magnetic field is applied, you create a Lorentz force on the vortices. So the vortices are displaced toward the second arm. When these vortices pass through this arm, they create electromotive force and you detect a non-local voltage. So if you measure non-local resistance as a function of magnetic field, peak, uh, magnetic field you observe peaks which are associated to the, uh, to the pass of these vortices through this arm. So this could have applications in quantum technologies. In order to even improve 
the lateral resolution of this superconducting nanowire, we have recently, recently used helium source focused ion beam. And we can create nanowires with width as small as 10 nanometers. We observe superconductivity only for wires with 20 nanometer width or higher. This is done in collaboration with Gregor Lavasek in Dresden. And in this uh, reference here, you can find more details. And maybe it's more interesting to discuss out of plane uh, superconducting nanowires grown with this helium focused ion beam induced deposition. Why is that? Because you can create nanotubes. Why is that? If you grow a standard nanowire, as the helium uh, ion beam is well focused to only 0.5 nanometer, you are creating a hole in the center of the wire. And the produced secondary electrons are decomposing the precursor molecule, the tungsten is a carbon precursor molecules, and creating a nanowire. So basically, the shape of these wires is a nanotube. So you have a shell with the tungsten and um, a carbon superconducting material and a hole in the center. And this hole can be as small as five nanometers. But you can also grow nanohelices. If you give this circular scanning shape to, to your focused ion beam, you can create this nanohelices in which you can control uh, the diameter and the pitch of the different turns in this nanohelices. When you do a super electrical measurement, you discover that these materials are superconducting. In this table, we compare all the physical properties in terms of composition, room temperature, resistivity, critical temperature, uh, upper critical field, etc., of the three different types of superconducting materials we are growing with these techniques. Two-dimensional helium focus ion beam induced deposition, three-dimensional helium focus ion beam induced deposition, and gallium focus ion beam induced deposition. You have more details in this reference. And my last slide is about uh, future projects. Now we are developing a European project in, co in cooperation with University of Basel, University of Tübingen, and IBM. The project is called FIP Super Probes. And here the idea is to create superconducting devices on a cantilever to be used in a scanning probe microscopy. So you know that there is a, a very interesting uh, superconducting device which is called a squid. In a squid, you have a superconducting material with two arms and you have two Josephson junction. And then the current through uh, this squid oscillates with the applied magnetic field. So it's a very precise magnetometer. So people use this idea to create nano squid on tips. So if you are able to create on a glass fiber two superconducting materials with uh, two Josephson junction, you create a nano squid and you can use it to image uh, the electrical current or a small magnetic fields on any material. This was recently work published in Nature. So our approach is to cross over from this, let's say, manual fabrication method of, of these nano squids to a uh, uh, upscaled uh, uh, wafer-based uh, technology. So for that, we have the help of IBM that is able to pattern many uh, cantilevers on a single wafer. And our role in the project is to grow uh, nano squids in these cantilevers in order uh, to produce similar results to this published here. Okay, so this is my uh, last uh, summarizing slide. So I promise that my challenge is to find new applications of focus electron beam induced deposition and focused ion beam induced deposition. I try to show a few examples like uh, the growth of uh, ferromagnetic nanowires for magnetic force microscopy, or uh, three-dimensional structures for superconductivity, or the growth of uh, nanosquids <laughs> devices. So I thank my, my group uh, and also previous group members. And this is my contact uh, email address. And I thank you very much for your attention.